Well, such a great introduction. I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. Let me say that I have the honor of being on radio and television, and I get a chance to interview some of the world's top scientists. And every time I talk to them, I ask them the key question, the most important question of all. And that question is, is there intelligent life on the Earth? Well, I was watching the Kardashians on TV last night, and I've come to the conclusion that, nope, there's no intelligent life on this planet, except in one place, right here. Here, we have some of the brightest, most inquisitive, energetic minds. Why? Because you want to know the big picture. You want to know the big concepts that change our view of the universe. And you want to know it now. So that's the theme of my talk. And we're going to talk about the history. The history of how scientists searched out the biggest ideas. And that made history, and they changed history now. So first of all, let me say, hold on a second. Oh, let me go backwards. Sorry. These are some of the books that I've written. They're books about physics and the future. In the book Hyperspace, I talk about higher dimensions, string theory, which is what I do for a living. Um, um, then we talk about parallel worlds, the fact that the multiverse is the home of string theory. And we talk about the future of the mind, how scientists are beginning to read thoughts in the living brain. And then my latest book is called Quantum Supremacy, about quantum computers, the next generation of computers that will make all computers today obsolete. But today, let me talk about the big questions now. It all starts a few hundred years ago. This gentleman here was 23 years old when the Black Plague hit London. People were dying in the streets of London because of this disease. And this young man was sent home. Nothing to do except walk on his estate. And then he came upon this apple tree. And he saw an apple fall. And then he asked himself a question that changed world history. He said, if an apple falls, does the moon also fall? And in a flash, he realized the answer was yes. The moon also falls. It's in free fall. It's falling around the earth. You see, in those days, people were taught that there's heavenly physics and earth physics. Heavenly physics was pure, noble, great, perfect. Earth physics was dirty, debauchery, jealousy, envy. That's earth physics. This man, Isaac Newton, said, no, there's only one physics, and it's universal. Earth physics and lunar physics are the same thing. And then he said to himself, I can start to write the mathematics to explain the motion of the solar system. But then for 20 years, he didn't publish. He was thinking about it, but he didn't publish. And then what happened was a comet sails over London, freaks everybody out in London. Everybody is talking about the comet. Where did it come from? Where is it going? What does it mean? And there's a rich man, Mr. Edmund Haley. He wants to talk to the great Mr. Newton, so he makes a journey to Cambridge. And Mr. Haley says, Mr. Newton, you're well known now, but the comet, everybody wants to know about the comet. Where did it come from? Where is it going? Do you know? And then Newton says, 
Yes. I've been tracking it with a telescope I just invented, a reflecting telescope. It's moving in a perfect ellipse. I can predict where the comet is going. And then Edmund Haley says, my God, nobody knows anything about comets. And you're telling me that you know where the comet is going. You tracked it with your mathematics. And then he said, for God's sake, man, why don't you publish? This is the greatest work of science in all history. And then Newton said, <coughs> well, I got stuck. And it costs money. It costs money to pay to publish this masterpiece. And then Edmund Haley said, Mr. Newton, I am a rich man. I will pay for the publication of the greatest work of science ever written, Principia Mathematica. When he paid for the publication of that manuscript, it was a sensation. What did it create? It helped to create the Industrial Revolution. All of a sudden, steam power, engines, boats. All of a sudden, everything was reduced to Newton's laws of motion, including the solar system itself. All of a sudden, one man asking a question, does the moon also fall? changed world history. We now know that Newtonian mechanics governs rocket ships. It governs airplanes. <coughs> it governs boats, steam engines, all of it. Newtonian mechanics explains all motions on the planet Earth. All because a 23-year-old man asked a big question. And then the next question is, what about you? What about young people? Are they going to ask the big questions that will change world history? And then a few hundred years later, there's a 16-year-old boy all by himself, a 16-year-old boy who also asked himself a silly, stupid question. He asked himself another question. Can you outrace a light beam? Can you outrace a light beam? And then he realized that in those days, light was a wave. But if you could outrace a light beam, the light beam would be stationary. If you're running neck and neck with a light beam, the light beam is stationary. But this young boy said to himself, now wait a minute. No one has ever seen stationary light before. There's no such thing as stationary light. In other words, the speed of light you cannot go faster than the speed of light. It took him 10 years to write the mathematics of this simple idea. Can you go faster than a light beam? It took him 16 years, I mean 10 years until he was 26 years old. And then he was shocked by the conclusion. He realized that the speed of light is a constant no matter where you run, you run toward a light beam, you run away from a light beam, you go sideways from a light beam, light travels at the same velocity, no matter how you move. But that's impossible. How can something travel at the same rate when you travel at a different velocity? The only way to reconcile this is if time slows down. Think about this. This is incredible. This 26-year-old man saying time slows down. The faster you move, the slower time goes. The flatter you get, the heavier you get. And he said, if you get heavier, the faster you move. Where did the extra mass come from? It came from energy. Energy turned into energy turned into mass. And the relationship took one line from his theory. And that equation is E equals MC squared. This is the greatest equation of space-time. 
It makes the atomic bomb possible. It lights up the stars. It lights up the universe. All because a 16-year-old boy asked himself a question, can you outrace a light beam? It means that time can slow down. It means that stars ignite because of this fact. This is why the star shines today. The sun, why does the sun shine today? It's because of E equals MC squared. This is the reason why we have atomic bombs, the reason why we have nuclear power plants, the reason why stars shine. Stars shine, unraveled by a 16-year-old boy who asked himself a simple question, a big question, can you outrace a light beam? And then the young Albert Einstein went one step even further. One step even further. And then he asked himself another question. Why, do, why does gravity pull you down? If you're sitting in a chair, you would say that gravity is pulling you into the chair. That's common sense, right? Anyone would say that. Why are you, why are you sitting in a chair right now? You're sitting in a chair because gravity is pulling you down. But Einstein says, no, that's not true. Why are you sitting in a chair today? Because space-time is pushing you into the chair. The space above you is pushing you into the chair. So in other words, if you want to summarize general relativity in one sentence, it is, gravity does not pull. Space pushes. Let me repeat that again. This is one of the greatest thoughts in the universe. Gravity does not pull. That's not why you're sitting in your chair today. Space above you. Space above you is curved, shown here. And space itself is pushing you into the chair. And who's correct? Einstein is correct. It was measured in a solar eclipse. In a solar eclipse, they measured the fact that light bends as it goes around the sun. I mean, it, light bends when it goes around the sun. Light does not travel in a straight line. Why? Because space is curved. Space-time is not straight. straight space-time is curved, and that's why you are sitting in your chair. That's why light is bent as it goes around the stars, and this is why Einstein goes on to win the Nobel Prize. And then he stepped one step further and applied this to the universe. If you're sitting in a chair because space is pushing you into the chair, this means that space itself can be curved. This means the universe is curved. And the universe is, in some sense, a, a balloon. We live on the surface of the balloon. And the balloon is expanding. And what is this called? The Big Bang. This is the creation of the universe. So in other words, that simple statement, why are you sitting in a chair? Gravity does not pull. Space pushes you into the chair. The consequence of that is Genesis, the birth of the universe. This is why the universe had a birth <coughs> that billions of years ago, the earth was very tiny. I mean, the universe was very tiny, and it exploded in what is called the Big Bang. And then the next question is, if space is curved, can it have a gateway? A gateway to other universes. This is called the black hole. Yet another consequence of Einstein's theory. And some people think that a black hole is actually a gateway. 
A gateway to what? We don't know. If you ever figure this out, if you ever figure out what gateway this is, tell me first. We'll split the Nobel Prize, you and me, okay? But the Big Bang is a consequence of this simple idea that gravity does not pull, space pushes. And then the next question is, if you're a young gentleman wanting to make a name for yourself, then what are the other big questions to ask? What big questions will make you the next Newton or you the next Einstein? Here are some of the big ideas which can change history. First of all, we know that the human body has a code, a code given to us by DNA. And then the question is, by manipulating this code, can we cure diseases? So the next big questions would be, can you cure diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease? These are diseases of our genes. But we can modify genes now. There's something called CRISPR technology that allows us to modify the genes of our body. And the question is, can we modify these genes? And then the next question, why do we age? Why do we get old? Why do we have to die? There's no law of physics that says we have to get old. The fact that we have to die. Nowhere in the laws of physics and biology do we have a statement that we have to get old. In other words, aging may be able to be reversed. This is something that geneticists are looking at. The possibility of stopping the aging process. You know that some animals don't age. They live forever. The hydra, a small animal that lives in ponds, a hydra has no known lifespan. It lives forever. It never dies. Is that possible now? Then another question, another big question, and that is energy. We know that energy is at a premium, but can we get energy from the next source, the sun? In other words, we're talking about fusion power, the power of heating hydrogen gas until it fuses to create helium like in a hydrogen bomb and extracting usable energy as a consequence. That is another big question. Can you create a way to create energy from nothing? On the upper right, we have a first attempt. This was done just a few months ago. In California, we attained the first fusion process. It is still expensive, it is bulky, but fusion could be the way to harness the power of the sun. We're talking about sun power in our backyard. And then what about the greenhouse effect? Have you noticed that the weather has gone crazy? We have droughts in one place, floods in another place, forest fires in another place, all happening all at once. And another big question is, can we begin the process of reversing, reversing this process of the earth heating up in temperature? And let me say that the future belongs to the young. The young are the ones, they will make history they're going to be the ones that create their own way of dealing with hardship, poverty, disease. They are the future. Now let me say a few words about myself. We're talking about big questions. When I was a child, I asked myself a big question. When I was eight years old, something happened which changed my life, totally changed my life. When I was eight years old, all the newspapers said that a great scientist had just died. But on his desk, on his desk was a book. 
an unfinished book, a book that was on his desk. And I had to know what was in that book. What could be so important that the media said that this man's book was a testament to his life? Well, I went to the library. I found out that this man's name was Albert Einstein. And that book was the theory of everything. An equation that would summarize all the physical laws of the universe. Well, I was hooked. I said to myself, this is my big question. What was in that book? a book that seized his imagination, an equation that would unify all the laws of nature into one comprehensive theory. And then when I was in high school, I decided to carry on that tradition. I decided when I was in high school to build an atom smasher, a, design, a device that would smash atoms and create x-rays in the process. So I assembled 500 pounds of transformer steel, 22 miles of copper wire, and I built a six kilowatt atom smasher in my mom's garage. Every time I plugged it in, I would hear this crackling sound as I blew out all the circuit breakers in the house. My poor mom, she would say to herself, why couldn't I have a son who plays baseball? Maybe if I buy him a basketball, and why can't he find a nice Japanese girlfriend? Why does he want to build these machines? Well, I said to myself, this is my big moment, to build the machines that reveal the nature of life itself. As I said, the leading theory is something called string theory. Let me quickly, briefly say what string theory is. We have so many particles we have to memorize in high school, protons neutrons, pi mesons, all these particles. How many particles are there? Hundreds of particles we get by smashing atoms apart. How can nature be so cruel to create hundreds of particles at the fundamental level of nature? Hundreds of subatomic particles with strange names. Today, we think they're nothing but musical notes musical notes on a tiny vibrating string. So that this would be an electron, this would be a proton, this would be a neutron, and all the subatomic particles are nothing but musical notes on a tiny vibrating string. So what is physics? Physics are the laws of harmony of vibrating strings. What is chemistry? Chemistry is the melodies, the melodies you can create on a vibrating string. What is the universe? The universe is a symphony of these vibrating strings. And then what is, in Einstein's own words, these are his words, what is the mind of God? The mind of God would be cosmic music, cosmic music resonating through the universe. That would be the mind of God. Well, unfortunately, I've run out of time, but it's been a real pleasure. So, as I wind up, let me just end on one final note. And that is, this is my favorite Einstein story. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So, one day, his chauffeur came up to him, and the chauffeur said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? <laughs> I will put on a mustache. I will put on a wig. I will be the great Einstein. And you can put on my jacket and be my chauffeur. Well, Einstein loved the joke, so they switched places. This went along famously until one day a mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is, game is over. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Michio, can I please ask you a few more questions before oh. you leave a stage? I think a few people are still a bit curious and we want to hold you hostage for a few more seconds. If you look around our audience, we have a very youthful audience. Can I ask you, what takeaway message would you like to leave for the youth? The message I would like to leave for you is that one, you are the creators of the future. The future is not yet written. You will write that future. And the second, is that wealth, society, prestige, where are the jobs going to be in the future? The jobs going to be mainly coming from science and finance. That's where all the top jobs are going to come from. And so if you want to be successful, realize that, well, take a look at all the billionaires of today. Every single billionaire you see in the news every day came from science, the science of computers. So that's going to be where the job market is. So in other words, learn the science. It'll open your mind to the universe, and it'll give you a good job. So I come from a background of politics, personally, and I think a lot of our audience members don't all come from science. How would you recommend that they connect their career path to science? How could they find that connection point? If, even if you are not a scientist, you know that wealth ultimately comes from science, but it filters into other occupations. Business, finance, being, being an entrepreneur, creating your own business. Realize that that is where wealth comes from. Wealth comes from science, but it filters through society, and that's where you can get a job. So you don't have to be a scientist to become a, a billionaire. It helps. But you don't have to be a scientist to be a billionaire. But the source of your wealth will come from science. That's beautifully put. I want to ask you one more question, um, if I could. You mentioned it very briefly on the PowerPoint. There was an image of it where you discussed global warming. I want to hear from your perspective. You posed the question of, can we reverse global warming? What's your viewpoint on that? Are you optimistic about it, or where do you stand? It's a race against time. On one hand, we have the fact that temperatures are rising. The latest results show that this is the hottest year in 125,000 years. I repeat, this year is the hottest year in 125,000 years. Oh. And it's getting worse. It's a race. The other race is, of course, uh, solar power, wind power, but it's going to be close. It's going to be a close call. And that's why I'm saying that fusion power is an ace in the hole. We hope to have fusion power in, you know, 10, 20 years. And by that time, hopefully, it'll be ready to avert the catastrophe that awaits us. It's a race. Yep. And it's not clear who's going to win that race. So a race against time. That's how you would describe it. Yeah. We have a very, very passionate audience, excuse me, filled with youth that want to do good to impact the future. How would you recommend that they can impact the future in a positive way to prevent or do their best to reverse global warming? Well, the first thing is that you have to learn things. Mm -hmm. You have to learn the basics, the fundamentals. You just can't be rich just because you want to become rich. No, you have to earn it. You have to understand what's happening. And then you know where to invest. You know where the jobs are going to be. And like I said before, science determines which jobs are going to flourish in the mm -hmm. future. And so, uh, in my book, I mention categories of the jobs that will thrive in the future. And so, read, read that chapter where I talk about the job market of the future, which is wide open for those people who know a little bit of science. Wonderful. Unfortunately, we're all out of time. Dr. Michio, thank you so much. Can we give him one more round of applause for that wonderful lecture? Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you.